Uh, good evening or afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the MIT Wine Masterclass featuring Bledsoe so Wine Estates. My name is Kevin McCumber. I organize food and beverage events for MIT alumni and MIT alumnus myself, undergrad class of 05, PhD 2011. And uh, I want to thank the MIT Club of Boston for continuing to support these events. Also want to thank the good folks from Bledsoe so Wine Estates for working with us. Uh, to put this event on, they've been nothing short of fantastic in making sure that all things uh, flowed smoothly. And I also want to thank our fellow alum, Michael Hayes, for connecting me with Drew and his team. Um, it's always great to have those kinds of connections in the community. I really appreciate Michael taking that initiative to, to put us together. I also want to thank all of you for joining these events. Maybe this isn't your first event, and if so, thank you for supporting our ongoing series of fine food and beverage events. And for those of you who join me in donating to MIT's COVID funds, thank you for your support um, as we're not out of the woods yet on COVID. And I think MIT is gonna do a lot of great things to help get us to the, to the finish line there. So the agenda tonight is super informal. I'm gonna hand it over to Drew and Josh in just a minute and let them run the event. Uh, we'll take questions as we go. And if there's time at the end, We'll even go to breakout rooms where we'll have rooms of about five to six folks randomly assigned where you can just chat with each other as if we were together in person, you know, discuss the wines, discuss life, uh, and uh, just generally have a, have a good time. And uh, we'll look to conclude somewhere around the 830 to 845 mark um, at the, for the end of the event. Here. So this event is being recorded and that recording will be emailed out after the event, so you can relive all the glory. If you want to ask a question, you can go to the reactions tab in Zoom and select the raise hand. And uh, we'll try to get to you in the order that we see them and uh, let you pose your question to Drew, Josh, and the team. Uh, if you put questions in the chat, they will probably not get answered. I'll try to, to search through those and, and pose them to Drew and Josh, but much better um, option to get your questions responded to will be to pose it using the raise hand feature. All right, now it is my pleasure to introduce Drew Bledsoe and Josh McDaniels. Uh, Drew, you probably know as former quarterback of the New England Patriots, who is now my home team, Drew. <laughs> and uh, Josh McDaniels, his business partner and winemaker. Um, Drew and Josh, thank you so much again for doing this event with us and the floor is yours. Right on. Well, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for taking the time to hang out with us a little bit in this crazy new world we get to live in now. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, people would have thought we were just being lazy if we did a Zoom wine tasting, but it's become normal for us. We've actually really enjoyed it. One of the things we've enjoyed the most, honestly, is that we get to, uh, uh, we get to be in some really cool rooms with some really smart people. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think both Josh and I would agree that if, uh, you know, we told our moms that we were presenting to a bunch of MIT people, they would have, they would ask us how much we had to drink that day. Uh, but, uh, uh, but we're really excited to be with y'all and, and uh, tell our story a little bit. Um, you know, as Kevin said earlier, you know, a couple points of order, um, you know, the chat function works great. If you just want to raise your hand to ask questions, that's great as well. Uh, we also, um, and especially with this crowd, we encourage you to go ahead and drink wine. Um, you know, if you uh, drink enough wine, uh, maybe you can bring yourselves down a couple notches to where we'll make sense to you uh, with what we're talking about. Uh, but no, please drink wine along with us. Um, I'm Josh is just finishing up sober October. So he's uh, uh, I think he's happy to be back with a glass of wine in his hand. I did not do sober October. We were in Europe a couple times in October and I was not going to go to Europe and not drink wine. That just doesn't seem to make any sense. So uh, maybe one of these years I'll participate, but if you're a gambling person, I would take the under on my, uh, my, uh, potential for sober October. Um, but anyway, guys, I'm, I'm Drew Bledsoe, uh, proud son of Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, I, uh, you know, grew up in this beautiful picturesque little town, uh, in Southeastern Washington, out in the wheat fields, uh, rolling hills. Uh, and it was a wonderful place to grow up, you know, a little Norman Rockwell painting of a town. Uh, you know, great support for all of our athletics. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, 
But when I went back to Boston after played went to Washington State and played ball for a few years, and I was fortunate enough to be drafted by the Patriots back in '93, um, you know, and people would ask me about where I grew up. I said, "Well, I grew up in Walla Walla, Washington." And I'm like, okay, well, well, tell me about that. Like, we had really had three claims to fame at that point. We had a funny name. Uh, we were actually a magic word in a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Um, we had a penitentiary. Um, and we were also famous for growing sweet onions. So Walla Walla and Vidalia, Georgia are two places in the U.S. where you can grow sweet onions. Uh, there's Oh, perfect. Thank you, uh, Brenner, for pulling that up. There's a, a picture of our little town where we, where we grew up. Um, really was a pretty fantastic place to grow up. Uh, it's the kind of place where, you know, I know that we had a key to our house growing up. I'm just not sure where it was because we would go on vacation and not even lock the house. Uh, it was just kind of one of those kind of places. Um, but when I got to the league, you know, we really had these three claims to fame and none of them were really very cool. You know, you got a funny name, you got a penitentiary and you got sweet onions. That's, that's not really what you want to brag about when you talk about your hometown. But thankfully for me, while I was back playing ball, um, our little hometown became known as one of the greatest places in the world to grow wine grapes. Um, and it was really fun for me because I could prove that, right? There were, there were, you know, a lot of guys uh, on the squad that uh, that started to get into wine around the same time. And so they would come over to the house. So they'd always ask, well, what should we bring? Well, they, I just would always tell everybody, bring a bottle of red wine. So these guys would come over to the house um, and, you know, guys are competitive in the NFL. Uh, so they would try to bring something really fancy. They'd go find some expensive bottle from Walla Walla or something from Bordeaux. Or I think there were some Sonoma wines that made it into the mix. And I think Damon Hewitt even brought uh, some Argentinian Cabernet uh, one time. But for fun at the house, we would do blind wine tastings. We would put all the wines in paper bags um, and taste through the wines with the idea that we were just going to pick the one we liked the best. Uh, and I would always throw something from Walla Walla into that mix because I wanted to see how the hometown you know, was doing. And every time I did that, we would win. Like the, We would do the big unveil at the end where we'd all vote. And then you would go pull these wines out of the bags. And every time I included a Walla Walla wine in that mix, the Walla Walla wine would win against these expensive, fancy wines from Napa and Bordeaux and other places. And that, for me, was really when the seed was planted that, hey, maybe after this um, really cool football odyssey was over, I uh, could go back home uh, to my hometown and enter the wine business. But, you know, not just into the wine business, but into the wine business with the intent of making wines that would stand up on a world stage. Um, so my last year in ball was 2006 with the, uh, with the Cowboys and we launched double back winery, our first winery we launched in uh, 2007. Uh, and it's been an amazing ride. Um, it, it's been so much fun to be a part of. Um, and, you know, I, I think everybody would probably understand when you can go back to the community that raised you, um, and be a part of an important industry and be a, try to be a standard bearer in that industry, uh, it has a depth of meaning that's, that's a little bit different. Um, and it's very, very important to us. And I think you'll get a sense as you hear Josh and, and uh, if you hear, as you hear uh, the, me and Josh talk going through this, um, you'll get a sense for how passionate we are, not only in, in about making wine, but in representing our valley uh, and everything that it's about. Cause we, you know, Josh will get to tell his story in a second, but um when you're representing your hometown, uh, it's a little weightier than just showing up in, uh, in, in uh, some other region. When you're representing your hometown that you're proud of, it has a deeper meaning, um, which, is, uh, which has been a lot of fun for us. Um, but uh, we're going to jump into the wines. As I said earlier, um, you've got two red wines, I believe. I think you have our, our 19 Bledsoe Family Cabernet and you also have the 19 Doubleback, which is cool because the Doubleback has not been released yet. So you're getting a preview before anybody else does of the, uh, the, the 19 double back. So, um, but I want to, I want to throw it to Josh and let him uh, introduce himself and tell his story a little bit. Cause it's a pretty cool story. Yeah. Thanks Drew. And uh, thanks Kevin for having us and the rest of the MIT alum. It's uh, certainly a pleasure. And, and I love, like Drew said, I love not having to jump on an airplane and spend a week away from my family to be able to do these and meet some great people and actually have a good time. It's been a, a silver lining to the pandemic, which I've uh, done my best to search out uh, as many as possible. But um, Josh McDaniels, I'm uh, the CEO and director of winemaking for Bledsoe Wine Estates. I'm uh, in Walla Walla right now. So it's uh, just finished up with harvest and trying to reacclimate myself to a normal life which uh, is proving to be more challenging than I expected, <laughs> but it's uh, certainly a, an awesome time of the year. We're 
kind of starting to review the new wines um, internally and then also just, uh, you know, spending some time with our families, which is uh, nice for a change. But, you know, uh, I also got to grow up here in Walla Walla. Uh, it's a beautiful, you know, small valley that's just, you know, just, you know, as a kid, I don't think you necessarily uh, appreciate it as much. I think Drew mentioned the same thing. And now, you know, I have two young kids of my own and, and, uh, and I just absolutely love living here. It's, it's a fantastic place to be. Um, I, growing up here, uh, I got into wine really young. I actually started my own winery when I was in high school. Um, much to my mother's very strong disliking, she would have preferred any other industry other than alcohol. Um, you know, maybe marijuana would have been worse. Maybe, you know, maybe I could have gone downhill or something, you know, something with hard drugs, but, you know, I, I don't think she appreciated the alcohol industry as much as I did. Um, but I, you know, I kind of got into it as an entrepreneur. My dad was, uh, you know, a, a serial small business owner. And uh, so it's kind of a fun way to try to make money when I was in high school. And it really proliferated from there. And, and it gave me a, I think it brought, I brought a fresh perspective on the industry that it was a little bit old and outdated. And, um, you know, I went down, I, I worked in Argentina, I uh, worked for Paul Hobbs down there, another great Napa Valley winemaker. And uh, having worked for kind of the founding fathers of Washington, um, Leonetti Sellers up here, it was just a, it was a great experience and really kind of showed and proved to me that this, you know, I did my own doubling backstory and um, kind of proved to me that Walla Walla could hold its own on a global stage in terms of you know, wine quality. And the potential was certainly there to, uh, you know, kind of really make a serious uh, shoot on your career here. So it's been a ton of fun, but, you know, growing up in Walla Walla as a kid, I, I played a lot of sports and uh, Drew Bledsoe was obviously this mythical godlike figure that every young boy aspired to be. And vicariously got to live out our dreams through him. And, and uh, you know, there's still a, a shrine in the entryway to the Wahai, the Walla Walla High School gymnasium that's uh, dedicated to Drew. And uh, I usually try not to say that when he's listening because he gets a bigger head. But uh, it's uh, it was a really interesting, um, you know, thing for me to experience. I remember specifically when Drew announced his retirement from the NFL and, you know, I'd watched his, his career and, and uh, you know, got took a lot of hometown pride in that. And then, uh, you know, I remember now being this young wine geek and thinking, you know, Walla Walla is at this pivotal moment in its history where, it, you know, it can go one or two directions. It can t continue, you know, qualitatively increasing and proving to the wine world that it's meant to be here. Or it could, you know, go kind of like the Lodi kind of route and it could, you know, be known for, you know, cheap Zinfandel. And um, it was kind of, a, you know, it was really interesting to watch. And, and, uh, and I remember specifically thinking, you know, Drew was this great guy. He's obviously good at football. I've heard good things about his family, but what the hell does he know about making wine? And, uh, you know, and to put that into context, too, in the mid 2000s, there's a you know a few wineries that were you know owned or or at least endorsed by celebrity athlete types of people. And none of them were very good. You know, there was, uh, you know, really treated like a Nike shoe endorsement deal. You know, slap your name on, on a bottle and, and try to, you know, sell as much as possible before someone um, catches on to the trick that you're, you're crafting. So, but Drew came out. It was really, really cool to watch. Drew came out. He did everything the right way. He, uh, he hired, you know, a great winemaker who was my longtime mentor. He uh, bought a piece of property as bare ground and then developed that into a world-class vineyard. You know, he took the long road, you know, not the easy road. And then he, you know, and, and most importantly, he continued to build a, a real business that was based on the success of the wine quality. And, uh, you know, in, in my past experiences at the time, you know, those things were very important and, and they were th all th individual things that nobody else um, that had been in his shoes or sh situation um, had done before. And so obviously um, it did really well. First Vintage was a wine spectator, top 100 wine of the world. And um, <laughs> we can now say that we're turning a comfortable profit and, and it's just been a really cool uh, balancing act of making great wine and doing it in a sustainable fashion. So something that I was very fortunate enough to take over in 2014 and now we have three wineries in, in uh, two different states, and it's just been a ton of fun and, uh, you know, very rewarding also at the same time. So I think it's a pretty special thing that he launched and has created. So 
Um, looking forward to tasting the wines, too. Drew, do you want to kick off with the with the 2019? Yeah, Washington? yeah. So you know, one of the things that that um, you know that that um, has been really cool for me as as the, the owner of the business that you know I kind of function as the board of directors, and I also my wife and I get to uh, we get to be part of the blending committee, which is. Uh, a really long, arduous task. If you guys really want to feel sorry for us, we have to spend days sitting and tasting through all these delicious wines and figuring out uh, which blend goes together with which, and then goes into which bottle, which is, uh, you know, some people dig ditches and some people have to sit around and drink wine. So um, I'm starting a GoFundMe page. If you guys can support uh, me in my time of need, I really appreciate it. Um, but uh, uh no, it's been a really meaningful thing for us. And one of the things, uh, one of the many things that I appreciate about, appreciate about Josh and about our entire team is that everything that comes into our winery gets treated with the same serious intent. There is nothing that we do that's half-hearted. There's nothing that gets a passing uh, attempt by Josh and the team all the way from the vineyard, you know, to the bottle and, uh, and, and actually all the way to the glass. Um, and uh, I think we're getting some feedback. Um, just make sure everybody's on mute. I don't want anybody to be bugged by you know something in the background. This is usually where my dog comes in and starts barking in the back of the Zoom meetings. But I'm down at the winery now, and the dog's not here. But um, you know, Josh and our team, and we'll talk more about this as we go forward. Um, everything that we do is serious, um, and it's serious in the intent of developing a product that makes people happy and therefore makes us happy, uh, which is our mission statement in our business. We, we are, our, um, our mission statement across all the businesses is to create genuine happiness uh, for our customers and ourselves. Um, and we're pretty selfish in the way that we make wine. We make wines for ourselves first, and we hope that other people agree with us. Um, but with the, the Bledsoe family Cabernet, um, it's technically our second Cabernet-based blend. But the story is different than that. Um, you know, when we got into the business, um, Josh talked early about, earlier about Leonetti Cellars where he worked growing up. Well, Leonetti was the standard bearer for qualitative Cabernet and Merlot in the state of Washington. They were the ones that really put us on the map uh, back in like the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, they were voted with one of their first vintages as the best Cabernet in America. Um, the vineyards that they were using, um, and Josh was at Leonetti when this happened, they, they were transitioning to all of the, all estate grown wine. So all their own vineyards, right about the same time that we were getting into the business. And, and uh, we planted our first estate vineyard in 2007, which is also the first vintage that we produced of Doubleback. Um, and so, you know, it takes three years before you have any fruit and seven years before you have a mature vineyard. We didn't want to wait that long. So we were very fortunate in that we were able to step into some of these, some contracts with some of the oldest, best vines in the entire Walla Walla Valley. Um, and that's what went into the first vintage, the first few vintages of Doubleback. Um, uh, one of which was the very first one, which was named top hundred wines in the world. Um, as, and we'll tell this story more when we get to Doubleback, when as, as, as Doubleback started to, as our estate vineyards started to come on and Doubleback became an estate project, we did not want to give up uh, you know, those contracts on some of the oldest, best vines in the entire valley. So we developed a brand around those that really becomes, and Josh will talk more about how he crafts these wines, but really kind of becomes a quintessential Walla Walla Cabernet. Um, it's a blend of multiple vineyards that have some great history to them. Um, but I think before I throw it to Josh to talk specifically about how he puts these wines together, I think one of the most important things to under, understand um, is why Walla Walla is special. Um, you know, Walla Walla, when you think about, um, if you haven't spent much time in the Northwest, when you think about the Northwestern United States, you think about rain, right? You hear about Seattle and Portland and, you know, all the, um, all the rain that you, uh, that you hear about over there. And that does happen. It's mostly in the winter. It's actually, if you've spent any time in Seattle or Portland in the summertime, it's actually quite beautiful. Uh, but that does happen on that side of the state. And the reason that happens, um, Brenda, if you can pull up that state map, um, the reason that happens is, there is that there's a mountain range that runs right down the middle of Oregon and Washington, the Cascade Mountain Range. And that Cascade Mountain Range um, works as a moisture trap for all this moisture that comes off of the Pacific. It comes in, it hits those mountains and it falls out on that side of the state or in the mountains as snow. 
falls out as rain or falls out as snow. When you get to our side of the state, it's actually more of a desert. It's like a high desert climate. So if you've spent any time in Denver, Colorado, for example, it'd be that kind of a climate where it's, it's, it's warm, it's dry. Um, and then, uh, you know, I know Josh will talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the individual vineyards and how the rain starts to accumulate more as you get to the, there we go. Thank you, Brenna. So yeah, you look at the, uh, the middle of that map and you can see those little mountains kind of ghosted in. That's the Cascade Range. And all of the wine, gro wine grape growing territory in Washington, at least for Cabernet blends, um, or Bordeaux style blends and Syrah is on the dry side. Um, and you see Walla Walla down there in the, in the bottom right corner, which actually dips down into Oregon a little bit. Um, and so what, what happens for us is we get these really long, hot summer days. Um, in the middle of the summer, we get uh, our, our sunshine day, our, our, our time of the day when the sun's in the sky is an hour longer than it is in California. Uh, but then we also, because it's a desert, it cools off really nicely at night. So that allows us to ripen our fruit, but then we also cool off enough uh, that we're able to get longer hang time and able to maintain good acidity in the wine. Uh, then you combine that with a very interesting uh, geological history. Uh, there are two, uh, two events that happen in the Northwest that are uh, the largest of their kind and that they've discovered in the world, uh, largest uh, lava flows. Um, that gave us this bedrock that's, you know, many, many miles deep of, uh, of basalt. Um, and then we also had the largest floods they've discovered in the history of the world uh, that came across that gave us a top layer of this really mineral rich sedimentary soil that, uh, um, um, that yeah, if you want to, if you want to, uh, at a later time, uh, you know, go research that just, just, uh, just go check out the Missoula floods. Um, and uh, look at the history of that. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, but when you put the, the combination of uh, perfect weather together with this amazing soil and bedrock, uh, you have a chance to do something really, really special when it comes to growing wine grapes. Um, and, um, and then Josh and the team, um, uh, they take that, you know, those blessings that we're, that we're so privileged to have and try to make the best wines they can make every single year. Uh, but Josh, why don't you jump in and talk a little bit about the, uh, the Bledsoe family cab and, and, uh, and how you go about putting that wine together. Yeah, the fun, you know, the fun thing is between these two wines is it's really about vineyard designation and, uh, Drew touched on that a little bit, but obviously we have our state sites, which the 2019 double back is mostly from two of those. And then, uh, there's a little bit of our, you know, Bob Healy, uh, Cabernet in the Bledsoe family winery cab. And then there's also a lot of these uh, contracted sites that we used. And um, I got, like Drew mentioned, I think, um, I got to know these sites when I was a kid working at, in the cellars at Leonetti. And um, it was really cool. You know, like people talk about, you know, globally a wine production, you think of, you know, what expresses terroir really well. It's, you know, a lot of people obviously gravitate towards Pinot Noir, you know, and even, you know, obviously Burgundy's culture was built around terroir and, you know, that's partially why it's still so confusing, but um, also, you know, like uh, Syrah, you know, in the Northern Rhone and, and uh, so these sort of these varietals that are really built around terroir and Cabernet, I think, especially because of New World Cabernet wasn't necessarily, it was more about like you think about Bordeaux, it's really about the, the chateau, right? It's about the family. It's about the house. And, and you, you kind of approach the wine in that regard. Now, so Cabernet wasn't really thought about in, in terroir because I think it's just not as obvious. Like Pinot Noir, it's obviously different. You know, it's a little bit more like forward in, in its regard to show the differences. But, but Cabernet, I think especially because it's so large and usually has more new oak on it, it just takes a little bit of time and, and nuance and understanding and, and ability to see that wine develop before you see, oh, wow, you know, these are, these are, there are, you know, pretty large differences from, as an example, um, our McQueen Vineyard, which is on the ridge line of fractured basalt down to the heart of that hill, that same exact hill where our Bob Healy Estate Vineyard is. Those vineyards, you know, that's what we're looking at right now is, is McQueen Vineyard. It's uh, high up on this ridgeline fracture basalt. So the wind comes from basically the south is basically the bottom of your screen and erodes all that um, soil and then also beats down on, on the on the um, 
the canopies of the grapes. But then you go down the hill a ways and we pick Cabernet down there where the soil deepens and it's a little bit more protected from the, from the uh, wind. And we pick Cabernet almost six weeks apart sometimes. It's just crazy to think about. And the wines are completely different. You know, and that's really like what you see in Burgundy where you say, you know, why is this a Grand Cru vineyard right here? But then, you know, 200 yards away, you're, you're picking some really mediocre fruit. And it's very similar in Walla Walla. And that's one of the things that I've absolutely loved about the area is that it's so complex and so multifaceted and diverse within what you can grow and the different types of just one Cabernet clone that you can grow. And so with Bloodstone Family Winery Cabernet, this is all, a lot of this is kind of the, kind of those heritage sites where Seven Hills Block One um, is, is a, you know, one of the backbones of this wine. It's the, you know, Seven Hills back in the early 2000s was, you know, it was one of the larger vineyards in the valley and was really one of the original vineyards that historically built the reputation of Walla Walla. And so this is the, you know, Block One's Clone 8 Cab. And it's, it's a very ripe site, very warm site. It's usually the, the first block of Cabernet that I pick every year. And uh, that was that was actually, the cool thing about this is that was actually, you know, made up Leonetti's Cabernets for years. It made up Doublebacks Cabernets for, you know, probably, I don't know, five, six, seven years. And so a lot of this um, is just kind of like a, a progression and like a historical transition um, from non-estate to estate. And then being able to look through the lens of that. So it's, uh, you know, and it's also for me, and I think for Drew, it's a kind of a personal reflection because when you think of Walla Walla Cabernet quintessentially, that's what you think about because you think about in the early days when, when all the Cabernets were made out of that vineyard, because that was one of the only ones around. And so it's just, uh, I think, um, you know, from a, from that, you know, kind of special place in your heart perspective, um, you know, blood, so family winery really reigns it in there for me, but you know, it's a, it's obviously uh, the other fun part about this is it's released earlier than the double back cab. You guys are getting a little bit of a special treatment here, getting to taste the new double back before everyone else, but it's always fun to taste. Um, I always tell people it's kind of like the preview of double back, you know, kind of like Latour has, you know, three different wines of, of Chateau Latour, you know, you get to taste the the vintage before, you know, the Grand Cru comes out. So it's a really cool experience from that perspective. But on a winemaking side of things, you know, it's treat everything that's brought into the building is treated absolutely in the same regard in that it, we're trying to make that those grapes into the best possible wine that we can. So it's a really it's, you know, philosophically, it's no different. It just really comes down to that, you know, exploration of terroir. Yeah, it's really it's really fun too, and it's been fun for me. And it's and I actually just we had a, a team meeting this morning, and I was actually making this comment to the team um, this morning that I, I always try to make sure that I don't offend Josh when we're doing these tastings. When I talk about the fact that uh, that our team is getting better, like we really still feel like like we feel like the 19s are the best best wines we've ever made but we don't think they're the best wines we're ever going to make, <laughs> you know, like, like I, I think our, our team, they're, they're competitive. There are a lot of athletes on the squad that understand, um, you know, that, you know, you're, you're, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Um, and so I always am clear to clarify with Josh and with the team that when I say we're striving to get better, it's not because we had anything we didn't like about the wines in the past. It's just that, that, that we're both wired. And I think our entire team is wired to continue to try to evolve. Um, and continue to, you know, and I think, you know, Josh and, and the team, uh, and we'll talk about what we're doing on a farming, uh, from a farming standpoint here a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, we're continuing to look for ways that we can incrementally keep improving. Um, you know, it's, 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 I was saying this morning, it's, it's, it's very easy to improve on failure. Uh, if you screw up, then you just don't do that again. What's really hard is to continue to evolve and improve on top of success. And Josh and the team have continued to, you know, make great wines that we're really proud of every single year, but they're continuing to improve. And so when you have this, you know, this 2019, you know, Bledsoe Family Cabernet, which is technically our second Cabernet, you know, the, the, the quality that's in that bottle, um, you know, if you took it to Napa, for example, you're going to pay three, four, five times the price for the same kind of quality. And we're proud of that. You know, I mean, we, we do kind of bristle at times. So like, 
man, it'd be really nice to sell these wines for three hundred and five hundred dollars like they do in Napa. But but we're also really proud that we can uh, that we can have a real business and share wines with people at a, at a price that's more attainable for more people. Um, that makes us feel pretty good. Um, we do get pissed off sometimes when we build out our spreadsheets and you go, Hey, what, let's see what the spreadsheet looks like if we punch in $300 a bottle. And all of a sudden it spits out a much bigger number at the bottom. Uh, but, uh, uh, so we get a little jealous from that standpoint, but, uh, but we also, it makes us really happy that, you know, with the Bledsoe family Cabernet, you know, you can open that on a Tuesday and not feel like you're, uh, you're, you're doing something stupid. It doesn't have to be an anniversary or a, or a holiday to open a good bottle of wine, which, which makes us really happy that people are actually consuming the wine. Um, but it's been really gratifying for me. I think the 19 Bledsoe family cab, um, I've told Josh in the past, like, Hey man, look, uh, you gotta be careful. If you make this wine too good, people are going to buy double backs. So <laughs> it's a, it's a really great value proposition because it's really killer juice, uh, that we're really, really proud of. And, and, uh, we drink a lot of it at our own home, which is, which is really, really fun. Um, Make sure you guys throw questions at us as we're going through here. Um, you know, Kevin told us you guys like to like to throw questions at us, so uh, it makes it it makes it fun for us when we can when we can do that and talk about what you want to talk about. But uh, but uh, switching to uh, switching to the double back, you know, quickly. And I, um, you know, double back was our first brand, and when we launched the business, we launched the business with the intent of making one wine. We were going to make one Cabernet and it was going to be the best expression of Walla Walla Cabernet that we could make every single year. We also planted uh, an estate vineyard, McQueen, that, uh, that Brenna pulled up for us earlier, planted that the same year with, with the hope that, that eventually that, wine, that vineyard would become the backbone of Doubleback. But every year when we would do blending trials, we're very, very honest about it. Only the very best we can do every year goes into the Doubleback bottle. And if our estate vineyards were not the very best that we could uh, th that we could do, then it wouldn't be an estate wine. But it is now an estate wine, and it's an expression of some estate vineyards that we uh, that we've come to know and, and love. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool, and I, I, I want Josh to talk about this a little bit more here in a minute. But um, you know, when you talk about those vineyard sites that that, that that we were talking about earlier with you know McQueen Vineyard at the top, and maybe Brenna can pull up the picture of Lafour Vineyard, which is down on the valley floor. Um, they're really pretty close to each other. They're within a mile of each other. Um, but there's like a yin and yang in those two sites, you know, where, um, yeah, here we go. There's the Ford vineyard. And so if you, you zoom in a little bit, you can see it's all these rolled river rocks, like you might see in, you know, in the Rhone Valley. Um, and when, even though the proximity is really close, when you're down on the Valley floor, you get these really lush, pretty wines. Uh, that have big fruit and they're just, they're just kind of these luscious, voluptuous wines you go up on the top of the hill a mile away. And now you get structure, you get acid, you get tannin. And so you get that yin and yang working, uh, you know, working in harmony with the intention of building balanced wines uh, or to steal uh, something that, that, uh, that we heard on one of our, uh, another panel that we were on complete wines, um, you know, wines that have, um, Elegance, even though they're Cabernet based wines, they're, uh, you know, we, we want it, we aim to make elegant and balanced wines. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do. Um, you know, and watching Josh and our team and what they do, you know, it would be easier to make kind of a stereotypical big cab. You just let the fruit get super ripe. You use, you know, 200% new American oak and you just make this massive, you know, obvious fruit bomb. And those were the wines that I've fell in love with initially you know went to napa first and then went even bigger went to australia with these big obvious wines he, right up front well the thing that i discovered on a personal level um was that the wines that i started to gravitate toward were wines that revealed themselves over a longer period of time um you know those big wines that i first fell in love with the most interesting sip was the very first one and then after that it just sort of got less interesting what I started to gravitate toward were wines that revealed themselves over a long period of time, uh, where your last glass, your last sip is the most interesting. Um, and in order to do that, it's a very complicated and detail oriented process that Josh and our team, you know, if you took these spreadsheets that they have that monitor every single vintage with all the lots and barrels and different um, vineyard blocks and fermentation techniques and these spreadsheets that they keep, if you put them on the wall, they would cover the entire wall. 
um, it's a very detail oriented, very complex process to allow these wines to reveal themselves. And it's, it's sort of funny because, you know, we talk about wanting to allow these sites to really truly express themselves, but in order to do that, it's really complicated to get out of the way, uh, which is sort of a funny thing. I've equated it at times to, you know, if you're raising kids, right. You know, if you're raising your kids, you want them ultimately to become their expression of themselves. They want to have their own character and their own, uh, their own personality. Uh, but in order to get them there, you don't just take your hands off the wheel and let them go. You know, you give them guidance and you give them, you know, barriers and boundaries. You try to give them stress that they can fight through. Uh, but then you give them the right amount of love at the right time. And if you do all of that, then at the end, you end up with something that has its own individual expression. Uh, but it's a, it's a really complicated and detail oriented, oriented process that Josh and our team go through. And it's, it's for me as a, as the owner of the business, it's just really gratifying to watch and, and admire. Um, but with double back, um, you know, look, uh, uh, the name double back comes from simply the idea that I grew up in Walla Walla and I was so privileged to live out my childhood dream and get to be an NFL quarterback for 14 years. And when that was over, I doubled back and came back home. Uh, it's about returning home. That's what the name double back means. It's not a, it's not a football term. It's, it's the story of, of returning home. And that has a level of importance that, that hopefully you guys, you know, can grasp. Um, and then if you're going to come back and represent your hometown, uh, you want to be as great at it as you possibly can. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're really, really proud of what, it, what ends up in the bottle. Um, I personally think the 19 that you're sipping right now, and I, we have, we have one of our, one of our mentors that Josh worked for growing up and I asked him, what's your favorite vintage? Uh, and, uh, he, he told me, he goes, well, the vintage I'm about to sell you, uh, which I thought was a very honest statement, but, but, uh, but it, it also happens to be true that, you know, we, we continue to evolve. Um, uh, and I think that Josh and our team with what they're doing, I, I really do think, uh, that the 19 is the best Cabernet we've made to date. Um, you know, starting back in 2007. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see if the critics agree with us. Critics are like sports writers. They're mostly full of shit, but, uh, but uh, every once in a while they get it right. They've been pretty nice to us over the years. Uh, uh, Drew, but, I think uh, you might have unleashed the hounds when you ask for questions because we have a lot rolling in the chat. And oh, I'll right on. Some of those to you. But um, yeah, just right to on. begin, uh, I thought maybe could you just, could you guys tell us some of the notes you're getting in these two wines? Kind of do a little tasting evaluation and compare and contrast the, the notes. Josh, you're in. Tag, you're it. Man, I, I actually have to fake this because I don't have either of the wines in front of me, but I wrote the tasting notes, so I should remember, uh, but I'm also, you know, still mentally within the 2021 vintage fresh off, and then uh, we're going through our initial, our kind of like the last stage of an, the initial part of the last stage of the blending trials for the 2020 wines, so um, what I loved about 19, though, was aromatically both wines were open fat, like early. You know, a lot of times you'll, you'll bottle, especially a high-end wine, and it'll be shut down. You know, it just won't be like, um, you know, giving up a lot aromatically. You know, you have to decant the wine and, 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 or sit on it for a while and really just let it kind of come out of, on its own. So I loved that about the 2019 vintage as a whole. And then also um, both wines have really great, like, like mid palate weight to the wines. Um, and I, I'm a very, you know, it's just like food and food and wine are obviously, you know, go hand in hand together. And, and uh, I'm a very textural eater. You know, I don't like, you know, slimy tomatoes or, you know, the pasta has to be perfect or risotto has to be, you know, perfect, whatever it is. And, and wine is very much that same way. So I, I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about the type of tannin that you're experiencing when you're, when you're, uh, when you're drinking great wine and I loved how the 2019 vintage really had really solid mid palate, like, like we call it fat or baby fat. And, uh, and it, which, you know, you kind of get into these wine words in public and you kind of start to, you know, wonder about where the origins of these came from. But, um, you know, the, the wines themselves just had great tannin profiles and I loved how they're drinking and they have all of that, you know, up front, um, pleasure, but they have the ability, you know, chemically and, and, and whatnot to go for a long time, you know, to sell it really well. So the acids are there, the balance are, the um, alcohol is in balance and it's just a, it's a really great vintage. And I think underrated in Washington, it will be underrated just because we had a, an early frost event 
um, which really wiped out like most of Eastern Washington uh, on uh, October 9th, uh, which was actually 10 years to the date of the last fall frost event that did the same thing, which was, which was funny. Um, but it was a stressful few weeks and uh, I made the tough decision to let the, let those, um, let the fruit that we had hanging continue to hang through the frost. And I found out a, a lot of why our, um, our, our state sites are so valuable. And, you know, we kind of ended up with these little green islands in the midst of all these crispy brown leaves around us. And it, we uh, ended up hanging the wines on the vine for another two weeks and just, you know, achieved perfect ripeness and balance in the wine. So it was a really cool, uh, I love, you know, I, I always feel like to make good wine is pretty easy to make great wine. Sometimes you have to take risks. And uh, certainly uh, that picking decision was one of those decisions that, that embodied that sentiment. Yeah. I, I tell Josh all the time. I tell Josh all the time. Um, I'm, I'm all about taking risks to make great wine, but if you screw it up, you're fired. So, um, um, but, but, uh, and so far he's still working for us. So it's, it's coming out good, but Hey, Josh, I think this, I think in this crowd, um, I think this would be kind of a cool crowd for you to flex your muscles a little bit and talk about how you manage tannin, um, you know, through the fermentation process a little bit. I think this crowd would probably appreciate that, uh, more, more than most. So, uh, once you, uh, once you, once you show us your guns and flex your uh, muscle a little bit and talk about, uh, tannin management and how you, and how you work through that a little bit, because it is really important for us. Like we really feel like tannin and structure are really important in wine. But one of the things I appreciate about what, what Josh is able to do for us is that we have tannin structure, but you don't have to lay these wines down for 20 years in order for them to be drinkable. Like you would find a lot of times in the old world. Um, and that requires a, an extra level of detail to have structure, but ha not allow the wines to be harsh when they're in their youth. So, Josh, why don't you talk a little bit about tannin management and how you. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you can approach tannin in the vineyard, too. You know, it's uh, uh, stripping uh, leaves off the canopy, you know, exposing it to sunlight obviously helps develop or, or you know, develop tannin in certain ways. Um you know, water management, you know, it's basically your ratio of, of skins and, and seeds to whatever's left in the berry, the pulp and, the, and whatnot. Um, but then you can take that into the into the cellar. And there's, you know, just the crazy thing about wine is there's always every every answer is a generalization because there's so many variables that you can play with. So keep that in mind. But, um, you know, what we really focus on is once the wine is in the fermenter, once the grapes and the skins and the seeds, everything is in the fermentation tank. And uh, so we do what's called a cold soak for about five days, which is really where, you know, things are, I kind of like to think things are just homogenizing. You know, you're, you're getting a really, it's really important to take initial solid initial numbers that are exact numbers. Um, and then you can kind of, um, you know, dictate the way the fermentation goes from there. But you know, we spend a lot of time, you know, dealing with with uh, temperature of the fermentation. We inject a lot of oxygen, you know, just air into the fermentation. And, and that helps, you know, so you can extract more with higher uh, temperatures. And then the oxygen, the air really helps polymerize, you know, lengthen those those chan tannin chains. And uh, there's actually some I haven't read the recent um, literature on the topic, but there are actually i think is still no definitive answer on how tannins are off actually softening in the bottle so there's some um you know interesting you know basically theories around that but um we're we're really focused on lengthening those tannin chains and so the w one big way that we do that is is through a lot of oxygen especially with, with and i'm really talking about cabernet now not obviously not pinot noir <laughs> um but you know cabernet we beat it up a lot you know we just lots of oxygen we're very gentle though in the way that we do it so this year i you know you've seen kind of the you know really um traditional de la stage um that are basically just pump overs where you take the juice pump it over the top because as the fermentation kicks off all that co2 pushes all the grape skins and seeds up and you got to get it back into the juice to extract out of that because that's where all of the, the you know the color and the tannin and the flavor comes from and uh, you know, I could get keep going and probably boring you by now, but you know, we are we're we 
experimented this year with just rolling tanks with just air. So it's really like physically soft, but it's um, still getting that uh, mixing action going on. And man, I just, I loved, because I was worried with the, this was, you know, I haven't seen final numbers, but close to or at at least record setting a year in terms of heat. And the last uh, vintage that was in that regard was 2015. And the tannin profiles were very large. You know, they were huge wines or massive wines. And so I was really worried about that going into this vintage. And uh, so playing around with this, this new extraction tool, basically pump over tool was a really cool thing. And I just loved the, the profiles that we got out of it. So I'm thinking about, you know, just being really gentle, physically gentle with the wines. Um, and then obviously, you know, once you go to barrel, you extract tannin out of oak too. So you get oak tannin out of, out of barrels too. So lots of different ways you can approach tannin, um, but I'll try not to not try not to bore everyone. You have to start drinking quite a bit more to get through that conversation. <laughs> even with, <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the, uh, one of the, uh, with a question, Ava, are you still there? Ava, you got to go off mute if you're going to ask a question. Where'd you go? Hi, uh, this is Dave. Oh. He's shy on the microphone. Uh, so, a uh, quick question. It was it was mostly thanks, Josh and um, Drew, for the, the overview. Uh, question, I guess, is what's the biggest risk factor specific to the Walla Walla area for having a successful year um, in winemaking? I mean, anything from weather reception from critics. Where would you say it's at? <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you, you t you're talking about the things that we don't like to talk about, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the early frost or the hailstorm or, uh, you know, uh, in 2020, on top of everything else that was happening in the world, we had massive fires across the Northwest. So we had, we had to learn a lot about smoke taint and wine, which we, we hope to know as much as we possibly can and then never use that information again. Uh, thankfully in the valley, the, the, the fires were far enough away that the smoke was high enough and thin enough that we were able to, uh, to survive in 2020 where we weren't in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, you know, so th those, those are the ones that, uh, that are kind of out of your control. Um, you know, Josh and our team, and we'll talk about our farming team here in a little bit, but Josh and our team have a little more flexibility to be proactive in some of those situations. Um, but there's still are those risks, um, Outside of that, they're the you know they're general you know kind of global market influences that we worry about. Um, you know we've uh, as a business um, have really started talking about um, you know planning for uh, skipping a vintage. You know what happens if we get one of those major weather events or we get a frost in early October? Um, you know and we and we just can't make wine for that year. So we. We've started to, to develop those doomsday plans that we hope we never, ever, ever have to execute on. Um, but, uh, you know, look, you know, if, the, if we had another uh, great recession, God forbid, um, you know, drinking uh, fancy wine is one thing that's pretty easy for people to eliminate, um, you know, from their budget. And so we have to account for that. And, you know, God forbid we have another one of those. But, um but we're, we always kind of have our eyes on the horizon. We have a long-term perspective, as I think you can probably guess in the wine business. Everything takes a long time. Um, you know, Josh is talking about some of the new techniques that, he's, that, that we've been playing around with in the winery. You know, these experiments, um, for us, the hardest thing about them is that the time to get to the results of your experiment is so, I mean, it's so long. These, these experiment cycles are years, not, not, you know, hours or days or months. Uh, to see the full impact of some of the decisions you make. You know, I've equated, there was one question here about things that, that what, I, what I brought from football into wine and there are, those things are all over the board. But one of the most frustrating pieces for me is that when I was playing football, if I made a decision, I knew instantly whether it was a good decision or a bad decision. Um, if my guy caught the ball, that was a good decision. If their guy caught the ball, that was a bad decision. And I, but I knew right away, right? In wine, sometimes you're talking about a decade before you know the full implications of a decision you make. You know, you plant a vineyard, you know, wait three years before you have fruit, seven years before it's mature, and then you have a few years in the barrel and a few years in the bottle. So, you know, you're talking about, you know, a decade plus to know the real implications of, of, uh, of some of your experiments. Uh, now, thankfully, you know, Josh and I, you know, um, have a mountain of knowledge from friends and mentors in the business that have allowed us to make really informed decisions. Uh, about what we're what we're doing, uh, but at the same time, 
you know, a lot of times you don't necessarily know until you get to the, uh, to the, you know, to end of the bottle and then wait a few years. Right. Um, but, uh, Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Nima. Yeah. The Dwayne Johnson of wine. Yeah. Josh, you see that you hear that Josh, the Dwayne Johnson of wine. Right. Um, don't, I'm gonna have to go put my tank top on, um, which actually would be really, really bad. <laughs> it should be really, really bad. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think, um, Oh, there's some cool questions in here, Josh. We've got to get to them. One of them, one of them is on aging potential. Um, you know, and I think, you know, when we talk about aging potential, it's one of those now that we have, uh, we have enough vintages behind us that we can say with some, uh, with some certainty that we know the aging potential of these wines. Um, when we first launched, people were asking me all the time, like, how long are these wines going to age? I'm like, well, I don't know because I can't prove it. Um, but the, the thing to me that determines whether a wine will age well is balance. Um, if you have tannin, you have acid, you have fruit, uh, you have a little bit of oak uh, used in the right way and everything is in harmony, then those wines will age for a long time and continue to gain complexity uh, uh, over time. If, you're, if your wine is out of balance, if your fruit's too big, too much alcohol, you know, too much acid, if, if there's one of those components that's out of whack, uh, that's not in, in harmony with everything else, then the wine's just not going to age very well. But when you have a wine that's made in a balanced way, that's when you, uh, that's when you're really going to be able to, uh, to, to, uh, to age really, really well. Um, um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, Courtney wanted to know what he carried over from leading a football team to leading a business uh, that you just threw me right in my briar patch. I love this. Um, you know, it was really interesting for me, honestly, to, see how many at a, at a 30,000 foot level, right? At, 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 the, at the high level, um, how similar the two things are in terms of what allows you to be successful or, or ultimately not successful, but thankfully we've been successful. Um, you know, you've got, you've got to have a great team first and foremost. You know, as a quarterback, you know, I was pretty good at my job, um, but I needed five dudes in front of me that were blocking their ass off. I needed guys open downfield. And if they did that, I, would, I was going to look pretty good. If they didn't, yeah, I was going to fall down. Um, but you know, and, and you got to put your team members in the, in the best situation to succeed. Um, you know, if I played left tackle, I would have tried really, really hard, but we would have sucked. Um, if we put my left tackle at quarterback, he would have tried really, really hard, but we would have sucked. Um, but we have great team members that are, uh, and we're going to talk more about the team here in, a, in, a, in just a minute as I throw it to Josh on sustainability, but um, you know, you put a great team in place. And then the other thing is that you don't really know what kind of team you have until you face adversity, you know, in football, that means you don't know what kind of team you have until you're behind in the fourth quarter or until you lose a couple of games. We got to find out a lot about our team this last couple of years uh, going through what we've all been through. Um, our team responded to the adversity that was thrust upon us in pretty spectacular ways. Um, we had to cancel all of our events like everybody else did. Uh, couldn't do any in-person stuff. Um, but we were able to, our team was able to repurpose their time. And, and uh, especially on the, on the sales side, on the production side, um, you know, it was fairly much business as usual. We're agriculture. So we were able to, to continue to operate. But on the sales side, we had to completely change everything that we did. And our team did a great job with that. Um, you know, you've got to be able to, uh, to quickly, quickly respond to adversity when, it, uh, when it's thrust upon you. And our team uh, was able to do that. And then it, you know, we talk a lot uh, about, you know, in our business, there are no such thing as small details. There are only details and every single thing matters. Every single thing matters. Um, you know, we, we've uh, adopted the, this, uh, this idea of no fault autopsies where we, we analyze every decision before we make it. We analyze every decision after we've made it. Um, and then we look for ways it was that the right one? Was it the wrong one? And then we, uh, then we, then we do that with, with, you know, hopefully without hurting anybody's feelings. Um, you know, we go forward and, and uh, watch the game tape, if you will. Um, and, uh, look at every decision we made and was it, was it the right decision? Was it the wrong decision? What can we do better? Uh, but there are a lot of those things. Um, uh, and then, uh, Josh, uh, Courtney wants to know, uh, what's been the hardest part. Oh, I, I don't think I want to know this answer. Um, uh, what's been the hardest part of working with a former NFL player? Um, Josh, you better be nice. I'm listening. Oh man. I don't know. <laughs> There's such a long list. Um, 
you know, I don't, I don't know about the hardest part, but I think, I think the best part is that, or, you know, one of the best parts is that, um, you know, Drew came in um, understanding that he didn't know everything and he was uh, willing to admit that. And so, um, you know, he was the uh, Robert Kraft versus the Jerry Jones of the, of the wine world. And uh, so, you know, that part's been, you know, really enjoyable uh, to understand. It's, you know, obvious, clear that, you know, Drew's experience and talents and, and whatnot are, are, you know, bountiful, um, but it's not necessarily, you know, he doesn't necessarily know how to make wine or, you know, wasn't involved in the wine industry before. And so um, I think, you know, the, one of the best things about it has been that um, capability, but it's funny, Drew, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, our kind of our threats to the business, you know, you take all the romance and the sex appeal out of, out of the wine, out of the winery and vineyard, and it's basically farming and manufacturing and, uh, and sales. And so it's a, uh, it's a kind of a funny thing. And, you know, and so we're not really, you know, sheltered from anything that's abnormal that, you know, a lot of other businesses aren't, you know, we've got everything mother nature can throw and has thrown at our way. You know, and then, you know, lately we're dealing with, you know, supply chain issues, just like, you know, Home Depot is or whoever, you know, and it's uh, it's just an extreme challenge. And uh, one thing that that I was also thinking about is just is, you know, we have around 45 ish employees right now. And uh, so, you know, empl employment's an issue, you know, finding the right people. And Drew, you know, kind of led me into into that on a, our sustainability talking points. But you know, people, the people part of, of the business has been a challenge this year in a lot of different ways from hospitality to farming. And so, um, you know, one thing that on that note that we do that we've focused on um, a lot over the last three years is sustainability and just the word, you know, it's kind of used and abused um, and, you know, in the food industry in different ways. And I think still misunderstood also, but, you know, it's something that we take you know, pretty close, you know, pretty seriously. And it basically means three things. And, you know, the first one was the obvious that, that um, I mentioned, well, not the obvious, but it was one of the things that I mentioned earlier was, you know, Drew set out to build a business and, and I've always felt, I remember my first college professor, you know, he told me one of my first days in class, he's like, Josh, it doesn't matter if you like to make wine, if you can't afford to do it. And um, that was a really good, uh, important point. I can't argue with that necessarily. There's um, certainly a lot of benefits to being able to afford to do it. Uh, but it also, um, around the word sustainability allows you, you know, being financially sustainable allows you to do the next two things, which, you know, around sustainability, it's always the environmental piece is the obvious one, right? And so we've done, uh, you know, things, all of our estate vineyards, since we've owned them, have all been farmed sustainably. So, you know, non-systemic herbicides, uh, we use a lot of organic sprays. Uh, we do things where, like this spring, you know, we planted hundreds of different uh, wild rose bushes and lavender plants and uh, juniper trees and whatnot all around our vineyards because, you know, it's not this monocropped culture that you see in, in the Central Valley in California. You know, we're trying to build these natural ecosystems where, you know, maybe we, we can um, develop these nice habitats for predator predatory insects that eat the, eat the uh, kind of the pest that, issues that we have. And so we create these balanced ecosystems just from an, an environmental standpoint. We also, you know, we, we've uh, done a lot around water work. You know, we have these slap flow monitors on our vineyards now. So we've cut down, we actually ran uh, numbers uh, last year and we cut down water usage by like 40%, which was really incredible. Um, and, you know, grapevines are actually a pretty uh, sustain or uh, like pretty, um, low usage of plant in general. So it's a, it was a pretty big thing to be able to do also. But the biggest one that, you know, that we've focused on recently is the people part of sustainability and, you know, understanding that we can't do what we do without a great team, like Drew said so many times. Um, but out in the vineyard, it, it goes the same way. And I think a lot of times it's kind of, yeah, here's our, uh, here's part of our farm team. Uh, you know, they, we started our own farming company in 2019. And I remember, Drew and I talking that, you know, it was a uh, kind of a point where it finally made economics sense for us to do this. But we were talking about, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you're looking at the, you're brushing your teeth, you know, and you're looking at the guy that's looking back in the mirror, you want to be proud of that person. And so we kind of set out on this sustainability pledge around people 
where as an example, our farm team, we wanted to make uh, as one of the, one of, if not the highest paid uh, team in the Northwest. Uh, we committed to uh, full-time health insurance, full retirement benefits, and also where a lot of farms lay their workers off after, you know, maybe eight or nine months of a growing season, we committed to keeping them employed year round um, through different, you know, odd jobs at the winery and, and whatnot. So it was a big undertaking for us, but, you know, the unintended consequences that we've seen and experienced have, have been enormous. You know, these, you know, we've got a, a core group, six people that, that um, have been with us the entire time now. And they're just, you know, I always used to pride myself in knowing vineyards better, our vineyards better than anyone else. I don't think I can take that cake anymore. I think, uh, you know, it's now they, they care so much about what they're doing. And so, you know, they take a lot of pride in what they're doing. And so it's, uh, it's just been this huge kind of paradigm shift in our culture of how we farm. And obviously that kind of plays into, you know, qualitative, you know, wine production. And so it's just been a really, really fun thing. And, um, you know, I don't think we fully understood the, the positive benefits of that decision, but it's certainly come full circle and been just a great story for us to, to share, share with people. It's been really, really gratifying, you know, since we launched this sustainability initiative to learn and now to be able to demonstrate. So these 2019 wines, by the way, are really, really special because that was the first vintage that we had our own farm team. Um, and we just had a harvest party with, uh, with, our, with our farm team um, a few weeks back. Um, and I was sharing with them that we talk about them a lot because I really think that you can taste the passion that they put into what they do in the end product. Um, and it's been really gratifying for us to know that doing the right thing for the environment and doing the right thing for our people ends up producing a better product. Um, you know, if we thought that we could uh, use a lot of chemicals in the vineyard and if we thought that we could, uh, you know, be better by uh, only hiring people for part of the year, then we would have a, a, we'd have a decision to make. Josh and I will jump up and down, especially in front of our mothers and say that we would do the right thing no matter what. And I believe that we would. Uh, but when you do the right thing and that produces a better product, that becomes a really cool and very long-term uh, sustainable piece for us. And it's, uh, um, and I really think you can taste it, you know, I, I just, you know, and uh, obviously I'm a homer, but, uh, but I really think that when you, you know, like we had, we were up there a couple of years ago and we, when the early frost came in, yeah, it was in 19, uh, when the early frost came in, um, we had to go help some neighbors to bring their fruit in. And I remember Pedro came and, and told, uh, the other Josh or, or, uh, that runs our farm company, he goes, Hey boss, uh, I'd be embarrassed if our vineyards looked like theirs. And we won't tell you who that was, but he said, I'd, I'd be embarrassed if our vineyards looked like theirs we take better care of our vineyards than they do. And I was up there this year during harvest, went up early in the morning, you know, they're out in the vineyard up in McQueen vineyard and they are happy with what they're doing. They're in the vineyard that was early in the season. So they weren't worn out. Uh, but, but, uh, but you know, they're, they're, they really truly take pride in these vineyards and treat them like they're their own. And because of that, I feel like at the end of the day, uh, you end up with a better product. So this sustainability initiative has been, uh, very, very meaningful. And I think from a long-term perspective um, is going to continue to allow us to, to make great, great wines year in and year out. Um, and I think we're going to see a, a huge advantage if God forbid we have one of those really tough uh, vintages. Um, Cause that's when, uh, that's when that, uh, um, you know, attention to detail really, really shines. So um Let's see. So we had a we have a hand up here. If we could uh, call on Jim Alder. Yeah, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, can you compare and contrast the terroir and, and microclimate for your estate vineyards with the with the two that you've previously shared with us? And why does that terroir or microclimate allow you to make your double back, which you, you consider your best wine there? Yeah, that's a long and involved answer. I'll, I'll take a stab at it first, Josh, and then I'll throw it to you. Um, you know, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to steal your quote, Josh. I'll let you, I'll let you come out with it about the, uh, about the, uh, the, uh, uh, Burberry scarves or whatever the heck you talk about. I, 
I still, jo- I, I plagiarize all of Josh's bullshit all the time, uh, but I won't, I won't plagiarize this one, Josh. Um, but you know, our, our, um, at the, at a very high level, um, it, it is truly qualitative decisions that we make. Um, if we felt like the very best wine that we could make involved some uh, purchased fruit, we would do that. Um, and we're very, very, um, what, we're very disciplined, I guess I would say, in, in how we do our blending trials. We do them blind. Uh, we sit down with multiple different blends and we taste through them with no preconceived notion of what's what. And um, the, the, the double back, first the estate reserve gets like the, the best you know, few barrels and then, and then double back is the best wine that we can make. Now, um, to us, that has become the estate vineyard. Um, but it does become a little bit like splitting hairs uh, because Josh and the team are doing such a great job beginning to end in the, in the, um, in the vineyards and in the winery. Um, where we're not putting out anything like I'm actually drinking our, uh, our family wine right now, um, which is technically our, our, our lowest or our least expensive, uh, Cabernet based blend. And it's friggin' delicious. Yeah. You know, and, and it's what we drink around the house more than anything else, because it is truly family wine. So it, it does become splitting hairs because I'm proud to have my name on the family wine, which is, uh, which is, uh, you know, our, our very entry level red wine. Um, but it really is a qualitative decision that we make every single year. Um, but with the estate vineyards, um, it becomes a little bit different uh, for us now uh, with the farming team and with the fact that we own those. But Josh, why don't you jump in and talk about that a little bit? And, and I want you to be proud of me. I didn't steal your, I didn't steal your quote, but I will steal that, steal that when you're not on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, appreciate that. It's actually a quote that I stole. So it goes both ways, but um you know, I think at the end of the day, so I'll, I'll start with the quote. It's just, it's not, I won't actually quote it through word for word, but basically the, the sense around it is it's, you know, one of my favorite winemakers is Jean-Louis Chave from Hermitage in the Northern Rhone. It's just incredible wines, an incredible philosophy. And um, they're just, they're kind of like, it's truly its own wine. And that's what I've always liked about it. It's never chased a, a style or a trend. It's truly its own wine. And he talked about that a lot in a, in a book that I read around, you know, what is quality, you know, especially, you know, in 2021 where technological advancements are greater than they ever have been. And, um, you know, there's, you know, thousands of years of winemaking experience and, you know, this, this gap between low end and high end wine capabilities is shrinking, you know, cause there's, what I would say is there's ways to cheat now, you know, you can add nasty things into your wine to make it taste better, or, you know, have better color or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, his thing is, you know, what is quality, you know, is, 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 is a Burberry scarf that can be mass produced really a, a qualitative scarf, you know, and it was a really good kind of a thought provoking idea to me, where it's like, if you can just mass produce something, is that really luxury? And I think at the end of the day, what I love so much about our estate sites isn't that they're just truly different and great. It's that they're truly unique and um, you can't replicate those. And, it, you know, we're the only you know people in the entire world that has this you know portfolio of vineyard sites. And McQueen Vineyard, as an example, you know, I talk about it's high up on a ridge line of it's actually a tectonic plate of fractured basalt that buckled up and uh, it's eroded completely on, on from the wind up there. There's actually windmills behind us and um, it's just extremely challenging and uh, difficult farming. And so the wines are unlike anything I've ever seen and, and tasted. Um, and then, you know, the, the opposite of that is Lafour Vineyard down in the rocks district of Milton Freewater, which is a sub avia of the Walla Walla Valley. Um, one spectator actually called this the most distinctive terroir in America, you know, which is a big statement when you think of things like Rutherford and Howe Mountain and whatnot. And uh, so it's just a, a, a cool thing to be able to have this, you know, basically this portfolio to pull from and then create, you know, one unique individual wine. And to take it a step further, I think um, like the estate reserve it's so intriguing to me that it's such a personal reflection of yourself in a bottle. You know, it's the lens of, of, you know, I read a good quote the other day. I think, I think there's like, you know, 1200 days of work that goes into one bottle of wine. 
Um, and that's if you only count that vintage. And, uh, you know, there's a year of farming, two years in the bottle and, or in the wine, in the barrel. And then, uh, you know, you know, a few months uh, before we release that into the public. And so it's just a really cool personal um, reflection that you can take out into the market. So and there's a couple hands up now, I see. Yeah, let's go to Bob. Dude. Great. Bob, you there? Oh, hi. Um, so I was going to ask a question of Josh. Um, I wanted to know how good is, um, in Josh's opinion, is Drew's wine palette? Because he's involved with the blending, I guess. So I just, I'm just i just curious. My, mine's not very good, so but I'm just, I'm just very curious about that. So Drew, Drew's got a pretty good palate. I'll admit that for sure. He's, uh, I, I think he's, he's uh, also starting to get a winemaker's palate, which uh, is a scary thing. You look at it from a different angle, I think. Um, but also, the, the, I think most importantly, his wife's palate's really good. So that, uh, that keeps us all in check. And uh, it's certainly fun to uh, – the, uh, the, also the other thing that I would say is we seem to agree a lot, which uh, well, we certainly have always been very honest – and uh, we seem to agree a lot in wine in wine styles, and so that's been, I think, a, a benefit, probably in my regard, more than this. But yeah, good question. Great, yeah, thanks. It's it's it, 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 it is it is interesting though to, to 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 jump on that a little bit is is that that I know from a personal standpoint that my palate has evolved over the years. I don't like the same wines that I liked when I was twenty four, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, and I think that, uh, I, you know, Josh is right. We generally agree stylistically. Uh, and more importantly, we both agree with my wife um, because she gets the final, uh, she gets the final call always. Um, but, um, you know, and, and, and for me, what that evolution has been, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, um, you know, we're just wines that, can, that, that reveal themselves over a long period of time. Um, you know, Josh and I, we actually... You know, we, we, we analyze every decision that we make and we try to make sure that everything that we do has some um, business application as well as, as, you know, just a stylistic decision. Uh, but we did make one entirely selfish decision this last year because we are both huge Barolo fans. Uh, we love Northern Italy. And so we went and planted a couple of rows of Nebbiolo because we just have to know if we can make that style of wine in the Walla Walla Valley. And so that one was the, not necessarily a business. That was the one that we was like, okay, we're just going to roll the dice here. Uh, if it works out, then we'll be trendsetters and everybody will think we are geniuses, but we're, we're, we just have to know if we can make Barolo and Walla Walla. Um, you know, so we, but we do generally agree stylistically on the, uh, on, on what equates to a great wine, which makes, uh, which makes our, uh, our business relationship quite a bit easier. I, think Mike's I see got Mike's got a question. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> uh, I've got like three questions. That's okay. <laughs> um, so we opened a estate reserve. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the differences between a double back and the estate reserve. And then I saw you just bought new property in Oregon um, and wanted to you know, hear a little bit about that. But also you've got the Bledsoe family winery, you've got double back. And is it a different corporate structure for each piece of property or like, just talk about like how you like split the business up would be interesting. So I'll jump, I'll jump in first, Josh, and then, uh, then you can, then you can piggyback on top of this. But um, so we started the estate reserve project, I think, I think with the 2015 vintage. Um, and, you know, once we started making enough Cabernet or at least enough Bordeaux style wine, um, you know, we determined that, that we're like, okay, the number one thing we never wanted to do, we never wanted to do any damage to the double back blend, which that's always going to be the, the, you know, of every, everything that, like we said earlier, everything is taken seriously, but, but double back is always going to be kind of that, uh, that um, original reason for being, but we were making enough wine that, that we felt like, you know what, there are some of these wines that rise above that, that, that rise above. And it's just a handful of barrels every single year. Uh, and so we'll sit down and Josh and Joe, uh, his assistant, will watch these barrels and watch these lots as they come through. Uh, and we really just felt like there was an opportunity there to take the best of the best 
and and give that the estate reserve um, label. And they're all it's all from our estate vineyards. Um, I think this year, I think the 19 that we're going to release, Josh, is the first one that actually is not designated as a Cabernet. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's I think that's right, because you have to be 75 percent Cabernet to call it a, a Cabernet. So we just we elected not to put Cabernet Sauvignon on the on the bottle uh, because we wanted to, you know, hey, if the you know Cab Franc is rising above or if the Merlot is really performing well or the Petit Verdot or the Malbec, um, we just simply wanted to, to produce, a, a, you know, a, a handful of cases of what we thought was the very, very best thing that we could do every single year. Um, and again, that's unscientific. That's just tasting. Um, and, but it does become, you talk about it that at that end of the, of the spectrum, it really does become splitting hairs. Um, and that's where, you know, hopefully what you're tasting in that bottle, um, it's an elevated level of elegance, an elevated, elevated level of balance, uh, in the wine. Um, you know, we talked at one point and I think this was, this was my, this was my internal conversation that I shared out loud was like, okay, well, if we're going to do the estate reserve, should we just go ahead and chase scores? Should we, you know, hang some fruit, fruit and let it get a little extra ripe and you know, use some American oak and make this big thing that, you know, and, and when we, I started tasting the wine, I was like, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to make wines for ourselves. We're going to make the best expression that we can make from the winery. And it, it's only a handful of barrels and that gets the estate reserve label uh, on the Pinot project in, uh, in the Willamette Valley. Um, that was actually, it was, it was a decision that, that was kind of thrust upon us because it was such an amazing opportunity. Um, you know, we started Bledsoe McDaniels winery uh, a couple of years ago with a few different reasons for being, um, we wanted to showcase both the differences and also the similarities between Syrah and Pinot Noir particularly in their uh, ability to express where they're grown. Um, also, I felt like it was time for, you know, Josh has been doing an amazing job for us for a long time, but his name's always been on the back of the bottle, not the front. Um, and really felt like, uh, you know, he deserved to have his name on the front of the bottle as well. Um, plus, I know you guys that are, that are business owners and, and uh, run companies, you'll understand the idea of golden handcuffs. Um, his name's on the bottle now, so he can't go anywhere. Uh, I got to... Uh, um, and, uh, so, but I, I did, it was, for me, it was an acknowledgement of the great work that Josh has done for us for a bunch of years that, uh, that now our names are side by side. I did win the coin flip. That's why it's Bledsoe McDaniels, not McDaniels Bledsoe. Um, uh, but that property that we, that we purchased in the Willamette Valley, um, that was really part of a three to five year plan to own property down there, but we were presented with an opportunity, um, for a vineyard that, uh, that was developed by a, a um, uh, a, a gal named uh, Mimi Castile who really views the world of farming the way that we do uh, in a very sustainable fashion um, and it was just this remarkable property that was presented to us um, and we felt like we couldn't say no so we accelerated our plan to buy that property uh, and then from a from the, the standpoint of, uh, of the, the, the the structure uh, of those three the three businesses um, you know, there's an umbrella that's Bledsoe, uh, Bledsoe Wine Estates. Um, Double back, we always want to be very protective of that name and that brand. And so it's got a very singular purpose. Uh, the very best Cabernet we can make from our estate sites every single year. Bledsoe Family Winery, that's where we produce wines that, that are, you know, priced at a more accessible uh, uh, price point. But we also can experiment a little bit, um, you know, on that side. We've got a wine club there. I'm actually... Uh, before I went to the family wine, Josh, I'm, I'm revealing how much wine I'm drinking. I apologize. I'm, I'm not doing sober November, uh, to be clear. Uh, but I was actually just sipping on some of the uh, Cab Franc that we produced uh, uh, as a club only wine for Bledsoe Family Winery. And so that's where we can experiment a little bit. We can play around a little bit. We can release some stuff, some club only stuff. Um, and that's the two big words in the mission statements between those two companies is, you know, double back is exclusive. Bledsoe Family Winery is inclusive. We want people to try wine. You know, if you, you know, if you, you know, there's there are a lot of different wines there, and we want to we want people to experiment and, and experience wines. Uh, and then Bledsoe McDaniel's. I think I touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, that's a passion project for us. Um, it's been really successful. Um, I keep telling Josh, you got to make more wine because we sold out of those wines in 24 hours this year. Um, but uh, the the Syrah, we're we're um, now doing three. Um, you know, three Syrahs from the Walla Walla Valley that are all single vineyard sites that are really expressive of where they're actually grown. Um, and we're currently doing just one Pinot Noir, but that may expand in the future. But 
Um, those are a little more geeky wines, um, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that people want to uh, want to really, really experience terroir. Um, you know, that's you go to Bledsoe and McDaniels. Um, we won't be able to make any 2020 Pinot Noir, unfortunately, because there was too much smoke taint. But um, but those are uh, it's a, those are fun projects. But they're all under one umbrella. Uh, but they have their they have their specific purposes for being and reasons for being. And, and uh, um, we understand it. And we hope the consumers understand it. Um, we've we've actually done some analysis uh, and had some. We actually had a uh, a group from uh, the University of Denver. Uh, some uh, grad students in their uh, their hospitality school. We asked them to go look at all of our um, our presence online and social media and, and all of that and see if uh, they could understand the reasons for those because we do. We wanted to make sure the consumers did, and they came back and basically reported back to us exactly what we wanted to present to the to the public. And so we were really happy that that was being received that way. But no, great questions. Appreciate that. Yeah. Hey, Josh. Um, here's a, here's a, here's, a, here's a great here's a great one for you, uh, Josh from uh, from Lawrence. Uh, um, on climate change, um, how's climate change uh, affected the Walla Walla region in general, and, and and our winery specifically, and how do we how are we addressing that? As it seems to be getting warmer and warmer. Yeah, well, negatively, it's certainly driven land prices up because all the large corporations out of California are coming up here, so we get to be the benefactor of that, um, not on the good end, but yeah, you know, we've now we're on a string of you know consistently above average um vintages which is you know one it's one thing to read about but it's another thing to experience so it's been uh, certainly challenging in that regard um you know the, just this year bordeaux in fact um approved i think it was five new varietals that are now classified that uh or that you can actually use in bordeaux not just outside of the the classic um you know cabernet merlot cab franc petit verde malbec Carmen here. And uh, so that was, that was a big news, you know, especially out of somewhere that's so traditional and so stuck in their ways like Bordeaux. Um, luckily, you know, just like I would say pretty similar to Bordeaux, you know, we're higher up obviously on, you know, the latitude of the earth. And so we have a little bit more room to grow into that heat that um, California, California, as an example, doesn't. Um, you know, they get quite a bit more heat than we do. And so, you know, we don't, you know, I don't want to say that we're not worried about it because obviously there's, there's a lot of negative side effects from that, but I think that we're positioned a little bit better, um, than some other, um, wine regions of the world, uh, to accept and grow into it. So the other good thing about, um, Eastern Washington and Oregon, the Willamette Valley down in Oregon, where we're at now is we have great access to water. So um, we can, we can uh, kind of grow into that also. Whereas I think, you know, regions like California, you know, in 30 years, are you going to be growing Cabernet or is it going to be more like um, Petit Syrah or, or something like that? And so it'll be, it'll be pretty interesting to, to watch how things unfold. And, you know, especially from, you know, we were out down at uh, Harlan, uh, I was down there in May with their team and a, a water perspective for somebody like Harlan, you know, it's just, I can't imagine being in that situation. Um, and then obviously, you know, forest fires has been a huge issue on the West Coast for the last few years. Um, 2020, for us at least being the worst, where um, we made the tough decision to uh, sell off our entire vintage of Pinot Noir from smoke taint, which obviously was enormously challenging for our, <laughs> so many different reasons. Um, so, yeah, you know, climate change has been a big issue and certainly something that we've been affected by and something that we're learning about and, and trying to uh, find ways that we can navigate it in a better, you know, more sustainable way. So hopefully, uh, hopefully the whole industry follows suit. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting for us, you know, I talked earlier about the long, hot days in the middle of summer. We get to the end of our growing season and that actually flips and our days get shorter uh, pretty quickly um, later in the season. Um, and so that, you know, if, if it is, a, you know, um, continuing to get warmer uh, toward the end of our growing season, it does cool off and we get longer, you know, longer night, uh, if you will. Um, and so that allows us to hang longer at the end of the growing season, which is uh, which is cool. Uh, hey, Stacy, thank you very much. I won't uh, I won't read this out loud, but uh, really, 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 really appreciate it. So thank you. Appreciate that. Josh, I'm going to 
have this quote printed out from Stacy, and you can put it on the wall next to the transcend the bullshit sign behind you. Um, uh, Craig, I do wear all birds, love them, very comfortable. Uh, appreciate that. I don't have an endorsement with them, but I, I feel like I should. The all birds are pretty comfortable. Uh, uh, but I see that Courtney, you have your hand up. Uh, why don't you uh, throw a question at us? So I'm just going to take this a different direction, but um, if you're on the one yard line with a chance to win the game, who do you want as your offensive coordinator? This Josh <laughs> or the other Josh? Oh, oh no, I want the other Josh calling the plays. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll let the winemaker make the wine. Uh, it is a funny story, though, when uh, like uh, uh, the winemaker, Josh, uh, got to learn a hard lesson about social media a couple of years ago when the offensive coordinator dude um, agreed to take the job with the Colts. Uh, and then he left him at the altar at the 11th hour. And all of a sudden, the winemaker's social media started blowing up. And guys were threatening to kick his ass if they ever saw him on the streets of Indianapolis. Uh, and so he was wearing that pretty hard um there for a little while but it's pretty funny even like one of the wine writers recently thought that it was a partnership between me and the officer coordinator of the patriots like no dude you're a wine writer do your research this they're different joshes they're two different guys uh, for any of you that are out there that are not football fans the offense coordinator for the new england patriots is also named josh mcdaniels uh and so that's where the confusion comes in sometimes um but josh was actually all the dude he was a pretty damn good receiver in high school um uh, he's way, way younger than I am. So I didn't get to throw the ball to him in high school, but, uh, uh, but he was a pretty good player, but I still think I want the officer coordinator calling the plays and I want the winemaker making the wines. I actually got a kid's game tape the other day sent to me. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you really? Oh, that's yeah, amazing. I don't know. If, I don't know. I hope he gets an athletic scholarship, not an academic one. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So good. Uh, Stacy, our distributor in Massachusetts is uh, Martinetti, uh, and they do a great job for us back there. We sell a lot of wines in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, Chris, Chris is saying, uh, that, that Chris, your wife likes to double back. Okay, so this is honest. My, my, wife, my wife always gives me crap uh, if I bring this up, um, and she says I'm just pandering, but this is actually the truth, okay? Um, if we make women happy with the wine that we make, we feel like we've accomplished our mission. And outside of the obvious reason for that, just making the women in our lives happy, uh, the other reason is that women, and this is scientifically proven, women have more taste buds than men. Uh, and from that standpoint, they can taste more in wine than, and this is generalizing, of course, uh, but women can generally taste more in wine. I know that's the case in my family. My, my wife has a better palate than I do. Um, uh, women have more taste buds than men do. And so these big, massive wines tend to appeal more to uh, a male palate because we're big, dumb animals and we need things to be obvious for us to enjoy them, where women appreciate nuance and subtlety um, and depth. Uh, and so if we make wines that, female, that the female palate prefers, uh, then we feel like we're making stylistically the type of wines that, uh, that we're trying to make. Um, and I, that may not be PC, but I don't really care. Um, but it's just, it, but that actually is the truth. Um, and it's been, there, there actually is science behind that in terms of, uh, of, uh, the, the women in our, in the, in the, in the world having better, um, tasting capability than men, uh, generally. Um, so, um, that's really, really good news. Um, but Hey, Bob, you had another question for us. Hey, Bob, you out there? You? Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm, my name's Brad Irwin. I'm with, with Bob. And uh, my, uh, I, I've been out to your beautiful part of the world quite a bit. I flew into Pasco three times a year for 10 years because we grew um, Welch's grape juice up in, uh, Welch's grapes up in uh, Prosser. So my question, and I met a lot of wine winemakers up there. So my question is, what do you guys do as Washington grape growers to, you know, promote the, the, the industry up there? And is there any difference between kind of the, the grapes you're growing in, in the Walla Walla area versus Prosser or other areas in, in, in that, in that region? 
I'll answer the first one and then you can answer the second one, Josh, but you have to be nice. Um, um, we, we do have, uh, we do have, um, some collective, uh, marketing, uh, agencies that, you know, cause I mean, Washington, it's the second largest, you know, wine producing state in the country. Uh, we feel we, we really feel like on a qualitative and certainly on a value standpoint, um, we can go toe to toe with anybody. Um, but in order to promote that outside of, of, uh, you know, our region, um, it takes some collective efforts. And whenever we're out on the road, whenever we're marketing, we're always talking about the region in addition to talking about our wine. So, uh, we all work together. It's, it's kind of nice for me, you know, I, you know, my former life, um, you know, very competitive. Uh, but in my former life, in order for me to win, I wanted the other team to lose. And I wanted them to lose really, really bad, especially if they were the Jets. I wanted them to lose terrible, and I never wanted to win another game. Um, but, but, but in the, uh, in the, uh, in the wine industry, with the, with, in Walla Walla, if our neighbor makes better wine, that's good for us, right? We want our neighbors to be successful, and we want our region to be successful. Uh, and because of that, there's some very open sharing of information uh, within our region. You know, we've, we've benefited from that. Josh has benefited from that. And now Josh is on the other side of that where he's mentoring other people and, and has actually uh, done some things, um, especially on the white wine side, which is kind of funny. We won't talk about that right now, but uh, where, where Josh has been kind of leading the pack and, and sharing information with other people uh, and, and guiding the industry. Uh, because if, if our region makes better wine across the board, that's good for all of us. Um, and then in terms of Walla Walla versus, uh, versus Prosser versus the rest of the state, Josh, you want to take that one? <laughs> Man, that was, that was a softball. Um, yeah, we, you know, I'm the uh, president of the board for Walla Walla Valley Wine, which is kind of the lead marketing organization. And, uh, based, you know, we work, you know, with, with everyone. You know, we really kind of have a Northwest wine focus. So a lot of what we do is just, like Drew said, raising, you know, high tide rises all ships and, trying to see and, and, you know, utilize kind of cross information and, and, you know, check in on things that, you know, especially, you know, last year with a lot of social issues and a lot of pandemic type issues, you know, what are you guys doing? What are well, we're doing this. What are you doing? So a lot of, you know, learning and cross pollination of, of resources and whatnot, and trying to, um, you know, make the, make the best of the money and the funding that we have. And, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, you get out on the East coast where you guys are, mostly I'm assuming. Um, and you're, you know, just as close, almost as, as close to Bordeaux as you are to uh, Walla Walla. So uh, it's a pretty, you know, competitive market and something um, that we all have to do a better job of getting the name out there and getting the reputation, um, you know, as, as squeaky clean and as high a quality as possible. So good question, but thank you. I think, uh, Billy, the, uh, why did Drew say you did the, uh, nice? Oh, <laughs> there's always good rivalries. Well, it, it's like the there's Jets. always good. There's always there's always good. There's always good rivalries, and we're we're supportive, but we're still trying to be the best. So you know that's that's okay. just the uh, you know people have asked, people have asked me uh, over time like, well, see, you left football. And I think there was one one of the questions earlier was about uh, uh, I forget where. Let me go back and find it. But uh, about you know leaving football and getting into the uh, the you know it's uh, is it uh, from Takashi was asking, how do you uh, um, keep motivation in the business, um, you know, versus the NFL? Well, people have asked me over the time, but like, so you left football. How do you replace that competitiveness that, that, that was so present in football? And I tell people, I left football and I got into the most competitive industry in the world. Uh, by product skew, it's the most competitive industry in the world. There are 50,000 unique wines made worldwide every single year. And you have to try to stand out in that crowd. I think the second most is t-shirts. I think there's 20,000 unique t-shirts made worldwide every year. Um, and for us, we are always trying to compete. Um, and we're competing on a daily basis, an annual basis. Um, um, you know, as we said earlier, it's a collective competition in a lot of ways. Um, but man, it's, uh, and it, you know, the other thing that's really fun about this business is that it's always changing. Um, it's changing in the vineyard, it's changing in production, it's changing in marketing. Uh, and we are trying to evolve and stay ahead of the curve as much as we possibly can. Um, but, you know, we're never sitting still. You can't sit still, and, and especially in this business, like any other business. So uh, it's pretty fun. But, uh, Billy, what do you got? Hey, Drew and Josh, thanks. Well, this is Dave, by the way. Sorry, I'm with Billy. Uh, 
So oh, gotcha. quick, quick question for you. Um, thanks for the, the event's been amazing. It, it, obviously you're dedicated to Washington State, went to high school there, college there. If you did, weren't recruited at Washington State, what were the other division one schools that were recruiting you and why did you decide to end up going to Washington State? Oh yeah, no, my top four, um, uh, University of Washington, Washington State, um, Stanford, uh, and Miami uh, were the, the the kind of the final four when I was being recruited. And it was a pretty different time. You couldn't just put stuff on the internet. You had to actually work at it. Um, Stanford was the hardest one to turn down, um, just because it's Stanford. You know, it's uh, uh, it's like the uh, it's like the MIT of the uh, the West Coast. Um, you know, where, you know, you go there and, uh, and, you know, it's a pretty good launching pad. Um, uh, it's better foot, better football than MIT, but, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but it was pretty hard, it was, but it was, that one was a hard one to turn down. But ultimately I went to Washington state. I, I fell in love with a coach up there. who's still a good friend of this day. Uh, Mike price and, and, uh, don't regret the decision mostly because I, I met a pretty good gal when I went to school there. So that, that worked out pretty well for me. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Craig, Craig, I see you out there. Hey, can you hear me, Drew? We got you. Ah, uh, cool. Hey, wondering if you're ever considering doing a white wine, or a second second part of the question, considering leaving Washington Valley and doing uh, Napa wine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so uh, um, uh, first, we actually do make some white wine. We make we make a couple of different Chardonnays. Um, one, we make a little bit of double back Chardonnay, very, very small production. Um, and then we make an Elizabeth uh, Chardonnay uh, on the, uh, the Bledsoe family side, uh, named after my grandmother. And it's really fantastic wine. And that's, that's one of the areas where Josh has really led the charge uh, in Washington. When we first launched that wine, he elected to pick about two weeks before anybody else in the Valley was picking Chardonnay. Uh, we didn't, we don't, don't own that vineyard. We weren't growing our own Chardonnay at that time. And the farmer looked at him like he was crazy because he was picking way before everybody else. Um, and again, I told him, I hope you're right. Otherwise you're fired. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but, but uh, uh, now uh, everybody else in the Valley is following suit and harvesting earlier. So Josh gets to say, Hey, I was right. And now people are following. Uh, and in terms of going to Napa, no, I mean, why would we go to Napa? We make better wine in Washington. Uh, and uh, uh, Good answer. We, we like to tell people, we like to tell people that uh, that we, we love Napa. We're glad Napa exists because otherwise there would be no place to get your your oil filters, your fan belts, uh, you know, all of those spark plugs <laughs> yeah, without, uh, without Napa. Where would you go shop for that stuff? But if you want really good wine, you come to Washington. Um, no, we there, we have we, and I say that obviously we're out of jealousy because Napa has a brand that we're aspiring to, uh, and we have some great friends that are making some killer wine in Napa. Uh, they just had to go to the hillsides as it's gotten hotter. Uh, but we'll go toe to toe with them any day. Like I say, we're pretty competitive. Uh, you want to give us the Pepsi? You want to give us the Pepsi challenge with Napa? We'll take it on any time, and and uh, we can do that and still sell wine at a at a price that's attainable to to get to get our level of quality um, in the Napa Valley. You're paying uh, I don't know three to eight times the price uh, to uh, to get the level of quality we're able to produce in uh, in Washington and especially in Walla Walla. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Craig. I appreciate it. No, thank you. And one follow up: If you're going to ski in Montana, where do you go besides Big Sky? Oh, we we have a place up in Whitefish, Montana. We go ski uh, at nice. uh, at uh, White Whitefish Mountain Resort. You got to ski in the fog there a little bit, but uh, man, the skiing's really really good. So check that out. But uh, yeah, Big Sky is pretty special, man. It's uh, it's hard to beat, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. All right. You got it, TJ. What do you got, man? All right, I'm going to re return to a couple of topics, or as you might say, double back. Uh, as an a undergrad at MIT, we were on rugby tour in Scotland, and that we're at a whiskey distillery where they basically said, we've got it locked in. We've done this 100, whatever number of years, we're not changing up. Nope. And so it was great to hear Josh talking about tannins and how you were doing a bunch of research. And then you were talking about being competitive. So the question I'm going to, I'm going to come back to is, you know, all, uh, you know, that's just one of all the different variables in terms of farming, the, you know, the, the picking, uh, fermenting, bottling, or, you know, uh, aging. So, you know, if to be competitive, I imagine there's all kinds of areas of research. And then, you know, how do you pick? How do you prioritize? 
and, and, and what's going forward. Uh, you know, as, as scientists and engineers there on a rugby tour, uh, you know, we were you know flabbergasted that oh, as much as we thought about jobs in a whiskey distillery, uh, if they weren't doing research, you know, what what are the opportunities and what what could we look forward to, and you know what what might come out of this. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, you know, we uh, we talk a lot about that. You know, we do a lot of research constantly. Um, you know, we, re we rely on the universities also, you know, have good resources around that. Um, and, you know, like right now, actually, uh, Jim, Dr. Jim Harberson up at Washington State, um, I would say is probably like the lead, pro lead uh, you know, research scientist around tannins and wine. So he's a super... Um, you know, great resource and valuable piece of, you know, asset and knowledge. Um, I can't always understand him, but it's a really uh, useful uh, person to be able to call up and try to walk me through things. But yeah, it's, you know, one, one also one like example, you know, I, I, I always struggle with that too. When people say, you know, we, we've nailed it, you know, we're not changing a thing. It's, you know, that just sounds really boring. And if you want to just have a recipe that you constantly make, go brew beer because, you know, you just fuck it up and then you just go make more beer. But with wine, you, you're constantly being challenged to do better. Like, I don't think anyone can nail it in wine. That's, I've always had a really hard time with the 100-point score. Uh, I don't believe in that. I don't think there's such a thing as a perfect wine. Um, you know, all of us will go to dinner one night and we'll, we'll probably all order something different, at least mostly. So, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting um, perception. But, you know, as far as research goes, one thing that I was actually really frustrated about was last year with, with the wildfires on the West Coast and the smoke taint that really uh, caused, you know, major issues. And, you know, Australia has dealt with this a lot um, down in their wine regions. But it was just really mind-blowing to me how none of the research would transfer. And it was so hard to get a hold of anything that was useful. And so I don't know what the issue is there. I've been trying to figure it out. Um, there's been a lot of money going, you know, now in the U S that's gone towards research around smoke taint. I know, um, I just read, I'm trying to remember the university locally that just got a large grant to pursue a smoke taint research. So yeah, you know, we certainly rely on that and are always trying to, you know, the one thing that I always say, it's, it's just like high school science class, you know, use the scientific method, change one variable at a time and go slow and try to do things correctly so that you can actually understand what you did. Um, but yeah, we're certainly trying to improve every year for sure. Yeah. No question about it. Good question though. It's one of the things that we really like about having our portfolio of vineyards um, because they're different vineyards that perform uh, differently based on uh, how hot it is, you know, quite simply. Uh, really warm years, you go higher on the Hilda McQueen Vineyard. Um, you know, cooler years, if we ever have another cool year, uh, you go to the bottom of the hill and it becomes more focused down there where, it's, where it retains heat a little bit more. Um, so uh, that allows Josh some of the, uh, some of the, uh, some of the flexibility. Well, hey guys, we've got uh, we've got uh, another virtual tasting for a big charity event that we've got to jump on here in a few minutes. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you for spending time with us this evening. Uh, Kevin, thanks for hosting us. Um, and uh, um, you know, we uh, and uh, to Mike for the introduction. Uh, really appreciate you, Mike. As always, one of these days we're going to get that uh, AI uh, AI wine project off the ground with you. Uh, uh, which would be pretty cool. But um, huge thank you for all to all of you guys for spending the time with us. And I'll also end with an invitation to come to Walla Walla and come see us. Um, you know, I think it's uh, hopefully pretty evident that we're pretty passionate about, um, you know, this valley that we get to make wine in um, and all of the things that go with that. Uh, but we really love it when people can come see us and you get to touch it and see it and uh, it becomes a, 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 a bigger, deeper thing, but you can actually experience it. It's a really cool place to be right now. And it's a really cool time in its evolution, um, you know, where it's still really young uh, in the world of wine, really, really young. Uh, we've spent some time in Europe the past couple of years, and it makes me feel kind of silly that, you know, you've got families that have been making wines out there since the 1400s. And we started in 2007. Uh, but in Walla Walla, it's still a farm town. You pull into downtown Walla Walla, it's still pickup trucks and, 
you know, farmers with dirt on our boots in downtown. Um, and uh, uh, the food scene has followed. There are great restaurants in Walla Walla now, and there are 150 wineries. You know, probably half of those are making wines that are really pretty exceptional. So come see us. I'm batting a thousand. Every time somebody comes to see us, Walla Walla becomes their favorite wine region, and they come back over and over and over again. Uh, and reach out to us directly when you're coming. Our team will make sure that you have a great trip. They can recommend where to stay, where to eat, other wineries to visit. Uh, our team has that pretty dialed. So uh, if you're coming out to Walla Walla, uh, just send us an email and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll follow up and make sure you have a great trip. But thank you guys so, so much. Let me return the invitation. If you guys make it out to the Boston area, we'd be happy to host you once we can get back on campus and do in-person tastings. Love to do that. That'd be fun. Thanks so much. I just echo everything that Drew said and appreciate your guys' time and would love to meet you in person and uh, hope we can uh, share a glass of wine together. Thank you. Sure. Great job, gentlemen Cheers, guys. and your team. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Cheers, everyone. Guys. All right. Thanks a lot, guys.